This is the Federal Mobility Policy Update with Sindhu Bardwaj from the National Association of City Transportation Officials, Beth Osborne from Transportation for America, Martha Rosowski from the Mobility and Access Collaborative, and Daryl Young from the Summit Foundation. On this episode, we'll unpack the Senate's plan for transportation spending. Could this measure result in new highways and actually make things worse all in the name of bipartisanship? Why is there no funding for transit operations? Why does it deny cities local control of designing streets? Does it exempt states from being held accountable for the climate impacts of their highway building? And could it blow a hole in the Biden climate plan? All that and more on this week's episode. Welcome to another episode of the Federal Mobility Policy Update. This week, so much happening within the Beltway regarding reauthorization of the Transportation Act, the Federal Surface Transportation Act. Uh, with us today, we have uh, we have Beth Osborne from Transportation for America. Hi, Beth. And we have Sindhu uh, Pardwaj. Is that, did I pronounce that correct? Pardwaj. Pardwaj. I apologize. Sindhu, tell us a little bit about NACTO. Sure. So NACTO is an association of 89 North American cities and transit agencies. We bring together staff from city transportation departments uh, to learn from each other, exchange best practices, and discuss the policy topics and ideas that we believe will advance safe, sustainable, and equitable transportation choices in cities. Great. And we have Martha Rosowski from the Mobility and Access Collaborative. Hi, Martha. Happy to be here. Great. Well, let's start as we always do with the three quick hits. Let's focus on what's been happening within the Beltway and specifically within the Senate. What are we seeing as the three quick hits? We'll start as we always do with Beth. What are your three quick hits? A quick hit is uh, charitably, the Senate uh, has passed a very disappointing highway title for service transportation. Um, The positive is we still have opportunities to make changes and improve it. Uh, And I think what is really important to point out is while there's been a lot of claims that this bill is part of enacting President Biden's uh, American Jobs Plan, this not only is not the American Jobs Plan, it undermines a lot of uh, what was included in the American Jobs Plan. Great. And Sandu, how does it affect cities? What are you learning? What are the three quick hits for that? So from the city perspective, the problem with this bill is what's not in it. Um, It really preserves the power imbalance between states and local jurisdictions, giving cities uh, no say in the projects that are built within their own borders. It also preserves a one-size-fits-all review program, uh, making it very uh, burdensome for cities to even use federal funding when they can access it. And um, it also undermines the work that cities have done for the past decade uh, to advance um, sustainable and equitable and safe uh, street design in their own borders um, by making it much more difficult uh, uh, you know, to access the funding that will accomplish those goals. Okay, three quick hits from the two of you. That's six, six quick hits. They're not particularly good quick hits. Let's unpack all of that. We'll start a little bit with Beth. Um, Beth, earlier, Sindhu was saying, this is a reform bill for the 90s. Uh, Talk about how this is really a disappointing outcome from the Environment and Public Works Committee. Well, uh, a a lot of it is that it just keeps the same program that has created all the problems that even the members of Environment and Public Works cite as needing to be fixed in place. I don't know how it is logical to believe that if uh, we have created problems in safety a backlog of repair needs, um, cutting off people's access to the things they need if they can't afford a car, um, you know, uh, increasing pollution, that the best way to fix it is to put more money into the program that created it. But that's basically what they've done. So I, I just have a question here, okay? You had telegraphed this last week in our last show, Beth, like you were worried that they might just repurpose the bill that the Republicans had written in the last Congress, is that is that what we got? And if so, why? I mean. Well, they did and, and they, yes, they basically did. They added more programs to it. Uh, the, the traditional, it's not even fair to say traditional, the pattern for the last 30 years to address the problems with the transportation program has been to create, you know, a billion dollar program to retrofit decades of problems while you spend 
$30 billion to create more of the problem. And there's somehow a belief, well, there's one of two beliefs. One is that a billion dollars can undo the damage caused by ongoing annual $30 billion of damaging expenditures. Or, and this is more likely, there is a belief that yes, yes, we've made these mistakes in the past, but we've all grown beyond it. And no one's building to make these mistakes now. And uh, that's, just, uh, that's just ignorant. So in either case, we basically have, uh, you know, as I said on NACDO's webinar earlier this week, we have an excavator digging a massive pit and we're trying to refill it with a teaspoon. Why? I don't think, I don't think the trust fund helps us. The trust fund means this only comes up every six to eight years. You don't develop great policy chops on something. You only consider that long. Members have come and gone in that period of time. Um, you, do, you don't build up uh, you know, a, a lot of staff time in the area because they've been working on all kinds of other issues during this time. Uh, and I just think that uh, the tradition in the, the, the Senate in particular has been the bipartisanship above all else. Um, this is one of the last remaining issues if there's any potential for it, hard to give that up. And somehow bipartisanship has been achieved by both sides willing to disarm and undermine their priorities equally. So, uh, you know, if I partisanly say I don't care about my priorities or what I promised my voters, I'm willing to agree to pour money into something that harms what I say I care about. You were talking for a second about the trust fund. You should explain for our audience what the trust fund is and, and why it's important in funding federal transportation. Uh, since uh, 1993, uh, we have all paid 18.4 cents per gallon of gasoline that we put into our vehicle. It's higher if you're uh, you know, a, a trucker using diesel. I think it's 24 cents for them. And that goes into a trust fund that uh, pays for the transportation program without having to go through the annual spending process. So it's a great bonus for those who rely on the money because you don't have to beg for money every year. But it means that from the, the White House all the way through Congress, you don't staff up your folk, your, your offices with people who are experts in something that isn't likely to come up for almost a decade. So it's like five-year autopilot spending without having to really think about where you're going. It, it is. And it's, it's more than five years because we generally push off reauthorization a year or two. So it's really more like seven years on the current schedule. It used to be a six-year bill. So it's more like eight years on that schedule. Yeah. It takes so, a long time. So Sindhu, so much hope was imbued and we still have hope that the real vanguards of redesign of our streets and of our highways rests within cities, within city transportation planners, within city uh, department of transportation directors and within transit agencies. Um, and it feels like once again, the state DOTs, which are often captured by the road building industrial complex has, has continued to receive the power as opposed to what we had hoped, which may still be that cities talk a little bit about the cities have the power. Talk a little bit about the loss or the lack of power being given to cities to make a better world for all of us. So I think to answer that question, you have to look at how the billions, tens of billions of dollars in federal funding actually flow to local governments. Um, and the answer is that, you know, it really doesn't. And very little of the tens of billions of dollars that the federal government is spending on transportation each year is actually ever going to end up in the hands of local departments of transportation. Um, so, you know, there's a policy called sub allocation in a lot of federal transportation programs where um, states have to distribute a certain percentage of those funds to cities or to local governments. But, um, you know, they can fulfill that requirement just by uh, building a state run project within the metro area that that money is meant to reach. And when that happens, there is no formal way for cities to weigh in on that project. It's probably not the kind of project that cities would build if you know, they were in charge of the money from the beginning. So even the you know, few provisions that do exist in federal law to give cities and metro areas some control over federal funding, um, you know, don't actually have that effect in practice. And um, you know, one of the many problems with this new bill is that that issue isn't corrected and the assumption that just increasing sub allocation or creating uh, new grant programs that local governments are eligible to apply for 
um, will fix the issue is still in place, even though uh, you know we've heard from local leaders and our members that that's not the case. So if federal transportation funding is a giant banquet, it's almost like you're getting a doggy bag and saying, go for it, but you can't have any decision on how the food is distributed otherwise. Is that, is that an incorrect model or? Um, yeah, the cities are not eating at the buffet yeah, <laughs> of federal yeah. transportation dollars. So give me an yeah. example of what can't happen if, the, if local governments are not at the table. Um, you know, so an example that's uh, really universal to a lot of cities is that um, the vast majority of fatalities that happen within city borders happen on state administered or owned roads. Um, I think it's something like 73% of traffic deaths occur on 15% of streets, um, most of which are uh, run by cities. And under the current model, cities have uh, no authority or ability to redesign or intervene on those streets to redesign them for safety or um, really uh, enact any kind of intervention that would change those outcomes. So uh, what we see all over the country is that even when this awareness exists among local leaders and residents that there are dangerous streets that need to be fixed, uh, cities and their leaders have no authority or means to really fix them. They're completely reliant on their state DOTs to take those actions. And unfortunately, we aren't really seeing them do that. Yeah, I was, one, one other example, I was talking with um, Kyle Wagenschutz who works with People for Bikes and they've been doing a really deep dive with four cities, Austin, New Orleans, Denver and Providence, Rhode Island to help them build out their networks of protected bike lanes like absolutely what we need to do, you know, create those systems that get you to a level where biking is a safe and easy option. So they've been doing a really intensive two year deep dive with those cities. And Kyle told me yesterday that none of those cities have used federal funding to build out those networks because federal funding, it's so complicated to use. It comes in little dribs and drabs. It's takes a long time. There's all these extra requirements on it. So it's just... I would argue that a lot of what we think of as extra requirements are the states putting extra requirements that they don't require of themselves, nor do the feds require of them on the cities. And they have a great incentive to do so. One is it would require very collaborative thinking about how to expedite somebody else's priorities. But two is... Why do they want people begging for more of the money when they don't feel like they have enough money to, to meet all of their needs? So there are so many times where the state is telling the locals, the feds make you do this and the feds don't make them do that. Right. Yeah. So it's sort of different layers of complication that are making it really hard to build out what we know we need to do. All right. So, so, so I was going to say that, you know, another layer of this is that there's kind of a one size fits all review program for using federal funds that, you know, states are imposing on cities. And I've heard, especially from smaller cities that don't necessarily have the resources to meet all of the requirements that are being imposed on them when trying to work with this funding. Um, it's really not worth going for federal funding for anything under $2 million. And, um, you know, that really does add up when you think about how the smallest projects are often the most impactful. And, you know, for reference, fixing an ADA non-compliant intersection costs maybe $12,000, but when uh, building half a mile of sidewalks can, co can take two years and cost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars more than um, initially projected, uh, you know, cities aren't really being incentivized to go after the resources that could help them do that just because the administrative burden of doing so is so high. I, I will also add to this for all of the talk of Project Streamline that comes out of Congress, they have never once done anything really impactful to streamline these small quick hit projects. They have gone out of their way to streamline massive highway projects. So if you have a huge highway with a big median in the middle and you want to add four lanes in each direction, we've given that the lowest environmental review because you're staying within the right of way. Or if you go by five times the right of way you need, you can expand forever through that right of way without having to do much environmental review. But if you want to build a few blocks of sidewalk, 
they, you know, for something that might cost, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, they're going to make you do, you know, archaeological assessments and do a contract on that alone. They're not going to let you bundle it with other contracts. And next thing you know, that hundred thousand dollar project's a million dollars. Yep. <sighs> okay. So Senate bill is more of business as usual. It came out of the EPW committee. Um, the good news is that there are some opportunities to change things, to fix things. There's two more committees in the Senate. There's a House bill. Um, Beth, do you want to start in on that? Yes. So uh, some of the bizarre construction of the Senate, um, they complain about uh, uh, stovepipes and, and segregation of the uh, various modes. Um, and lack of systematic thinking, but to pass a bill through the Senate, you need the Environment and Public Works Committee to pass a highway title. You need the Banking, uh, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee to pass a transit title. You need the Commerce, Science and something uh, committee to pass a, a rail and uh, truck safety and a couple of other things like uh, the, all the stuff that NHTSA handles like cafe standards, that title. And then the finance committee has to pass uh, the, the spending package to go to the floor. So uh, the two big substantive bill bills left to come are the transit and the, the rail title. Um, commerce is just working super duper well together. Um, we have uh, a lot of, uh, actually Senator Wicker, who's the ranking member has just been a huge leader on rail. Um, and that has made it very easy for uh, chairwoman uh, can't well to work with him. So I think we'll see a good bipartisan bill out of them. I think um, uh, banking is has a tough time. Uh, Senator uh, Ranking Member Toomey from uh, Pennsylvania has been one of the lead Republicans arguing to take back all the unspent emergency transit operating funds that we fought for over the last year. Remember, those operating funds were supposed to help them survive for the next year or so. But to me and uh, his colleagues position is that money that is meant to help uh, transit agencies over the next year should have already been spent. And if it wasn't spent already, it's not needed. So the emergency is over and we want our money back to build more highways. Um, that's gonna be a tough spot for uh, Chairman Brown to, to come up with a good bipartisan uh, title. And then they go to the floor with Schumer hoping to take that to the floor before 4th of July, which I think is gonna be really hard. And then the House is gonna be reissuing their bill. It's gonna look, from what I understand, a lot like last year's. However, uh, I would expect to see some even, uh, some improvements and um, some new ideas included in it as well. Um, uh, Chairman DeFazio just continues to be quite the leader in this area. And they're hoping to mark something up the week of June 7th. So. Lots of things going on with reauthorization. And then there's a big question of how it is or isn't wrapped in with the American Jobs Plan proposal. So, Sindhu, your organization not only represents city transportation officials, but it also represents transit agencies. They can't be happy with the potential of losing the dollars they've already programmed to maintain transit service. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So... When we secured the billions of dollars in transit aid uh, earlier this year through the rescue plan, um, that money was really meant to uh, help transit agencies through you know, what's expected to be a really long recovery period. Uh, we don't know how long it'll take for transit ridership to get back to where it was before the pandemic. And we're still waiting to see how the change in commuting patterns and travel patterns uh, at this part of the uh, pandemic really shake out. So it's extremely premature to say that transit agencies don't need that money and it can be diverted to other purposes just because, um, you know, I think they're waiting to see and be prepared for what happens, uh, you know, as the recovery continues. There are just so many unknowns to be making that kind of judgment at this point. So. Um, in but in terms of looking forward to policy change through the banking committee's work, um, you know, we really would like to see a transit operating program move forward uh, because we know that the quality of transit is really dependent on things like frequency and reliability. And currently the federal program isn't paying for those things. It's only paying for 
uh, the expansion of, uh, you know, transit uh, systems and capital improvements. So if we really want to direct federal resources to the things that will improve uh, transit service and the experience of transit riders, that means paying for operations. That's good, that's good to know. Um, I will also just point out that the effect of what the Senator Toomey and some of the Republicans are proposing is first, there would be a huge crash in transit systems and transit service, and then we would reauthorize the transit program. That's about the amount of sense that the proposal makes. So I'm <laughs> just sort of dumbfounded. Um, let's talk, knowing that a fair amount of our funders who watch this show are really interested in climate. Can you talk a little bit about the climate proposals or lack thereof in, in the Senate bill? I sure can. They have created a, a, a comparatively sizable carbon reduction program uh, that funds projects that reduce carbon uh, emissions and also um, helps states afford just a plan for carbon reduction. The way it was proposed, um, it, it created a, a handful of exemptions from the program. So uh, states with uh, that don't have a, a, a big city or have overall low density would be exempted from even having to plan. Mm -hmm. And they have that was removed. But uh, what they've left in there is any state that can show that they will reduce carbon, that they, they project they will reduce carbon emissions, no information on how, how accurate that has to be, uh, that they will reduce carbon emissions per capita or per economic output unit. I believe that was a terminology used. Uh, doesn't have to use the money uh, for the eligible purposes. They can transfer it really to any purpose that they want. So all you have to do, you can show that you're, you, you expect your carbon emissions to rise, but your economy is going to grow faster. So those are two big assumptions, right? Um, I, you know, I, I'm in uh, state A and I think my economy is going to go gangbusters. So this increase in carbon is not as big. I don't have to do anything. I can just go uh, uh, expand highways and do things that I know is going to induce demand and increase uh, BMT and carbon emissions. But <laughs> Um, that remains in there. And of course, the, the problem is we can't negotiate with the climate and say, you need to forgive me, I lowered carbon per capita or per economic output unit. We increase carbon, we get the impacts, full stop. So what happens if they're wrong in their estimation? There's no consequences. Uh, the, well, I mean, other than you know, catastrophic global climate change, nothing. Yeah. There's, so there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no backstop. It's just like you have to have good feelings about climate. And if you have good feelings about climate, then we're all good. Almost. It's almost that bad. And I will say there's also a charging program uh, to put out uh, uh, chargers for uh, electric vehicles. It also includes hydrogen stations, but it includes propane and natural gas stations. Uh, so we'll spend five years building out uh, natural gas and propane stations in some areas that will have a decade or more of life, which would put us be beyond the 2030 goal that the president has set out of reducing carbon uh, by 50%. So I, it, it just, it is, uh, it is not an aggressive uh, approach. And I think Sindhu put it absolutely perfectly, which is this would have been a fantastic proposal for 20 years ago. Um, one of the things that needs to occur within the advocacy community is that there ought not to be a balkanization by saying I have a very low expectation of what I want. And if I get this tiny little crumb, then I'm good. What needs to happen is that the activists that have brought us so far that have made reauthorization even an issue um, need to come together and stick tight and, and have high demands some of those demands are represented in the trans, uh, Future of Transportation Caucus. Um, there are other members in the Senate that, that kind of get that. Is there, it, there's still a window to make a difference. Is that, is that what I hear, hear you saying, Beth and Sindhu? Absolutely. We, we need to let people know that if you really want change, 
it's not about just creating a program to fix past damage. It's about stopping creating future damage. And the deal that the Senate wants us to make is we will use your hard earned dollar to fix damage while recreating it. And we should say just on basic, frankly, conservative principles, that is a waste of my money. But, you know, on other principles, I actually want a different outcome. I think so, it's a matter of like how how broadly do you look at this bill and the impacts of it on on transportation? Because I know, you know, friends in the bike community are excited because there are little stuff that it is in there for bikes. Like you say, Beth, there there are some small little programs that do good things in the Senate bill. And yet you look at the bulk of the money, the vast majority of the money is still going towards building new highways and things that really are counter to where we need to be heading. So like Daryl says, that slightly broader expansive view I think is, is important. Um, we're running low on time. So let's pivot quickly, Amer the American Jobs Plan. Beth, you said this is not the American Jobs Plan. And I think that gets confusing, right? People are like, oh, the infrastructure bill. It's like, what, you know, <laughs> what are these two separate things and what's, what's the path for the American Jobs Plan? Well, it's hard to know. That's a separate negotiation going on right now between the White House and Senate Republicans on how much they want to spend. But uh, frankly, one of the reasons it's confusing is the Senate Republicans have mushed them together. Uh, in doing so, it makes the overall spending look bigger. And therefore, they can say, you know, we're proposing a trillion dollars compared to your one point. Uh, eight trillion, uh, when in reality, what the uh, president is proposing is a reauthorization proposal of an underlying, you know, three to four, 400 million plus one point whatever trillion. Um, so they're by mushing it together, they're making it a little bit more confusing. I know what they're trying to do. And there should be some collaboration and understanding that both programs are supporting each other, but it's been mushed together. So it's confusing. So the underlying bill is the bill that we use on an ongoing basis and have for decades to fund our uh, uh, transit and uh, highway system, and recently uh, to start to make improvements to passenger rail. It also includes some, some safety regulation and inspection uh, and, and a couple other things. Um, what the American Jobs Plan was, was an ambitious proposal for new programs to do new things like uh, reconnecting neighborhoods that were uh, divided or destroyed by urban highways or a real turn and focus on maintenance and vision zero uh, and things like that. This bill does not focus on maintenance and vision zero. To, so to say that this is the American Jobs Act is wrong. In fact, what this bill will do is undermine maintenance and vision zero. So it might feel good to say we're pushing the American jobs plan, but you have to look at the substance and it's literally doing the opposite of what was called for. Great. Um, so it looks and sounds great, but is less filling than we need it to be to meet all of our needs. I'm particularly struck with the fact that the Senate um, has disconnected the importance of city transportation officials upon all of this and that many of the problems we have that people experience that are not on highways, but what, that are in, under the scope and control of cities um, are being neglected by this proposal. And, and you know, my hope is that certainly um, the other committees in the Senate, as well as in the House, come to grips with the importance of that where people live are cities and cities can make people's lives measurably better through the way they redesign the streets. So much of a property within a city, so much of the land space within a city is a street. And NACDO has done a lot to redesign our cities to make, to during the pandemic, to make outdoor dining possible, to make walking and biking possible. You've created templates and created things like bike, protected bike lanes. That creativity and power doesn't seem to be recognized by the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. I have hope that the other committees do get that. Um, as we close out, we like to always ask a somewhat inane or odd question. I'm going to toss it to Martha to ask the question because I can't remember what we agreed the question would be. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long week. Uh, so I've been pondering, you know, all these fabulous people who work in transportation that I think very few of us set out with a career path 
to become a transportation expert, a transportation professional. And yet here we are. So quick question is, what's, what's another job that you had before you became a transportation expert? Well, I can tell you that I initially thought I was going to be a lawyer um, and I went into law, to law school and I realized that law school was about implementing someone else's vision rather than creating your own. And so I ran away from that uh, and took a circuitous route to transportation and the nuts and bolts of it, not just the law around it, uh, the, the engineering and the planning. But a more fun uh, story is I used, uh, I used to work at my cousin's sushi restaurant every summer. Huh. Sindhu? Um, so, you know, growing up, I did not know that transportation expert was a job. I didn't know urban planner was a job. Um, and uh, I've had a lot of odd jobs in my life. I was a tour guide at a museum at one point. I uh, was a receptionist at a doctor's office at, at a different time. Um, and I took kind of a roundabout route to transportation. Uh, my background is actually in environmental policy and organizing and um, transportation just seemed like the field that contributed so much. I think, mean, you know, maybe a third of this country's emissions uh, come from transportation. Um, but in my view, that was something that was neglected by uh, the mainstream environmental organizing and activism going on. And, uh, you know, that's how I found my way to transportation. Martha, what was your what was your odd job that led you to this? So I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, like you know, a lot of people. I ended up coming out of college with a degree in journalism after a stint at public radio. I got into organizing events, and then I got hired to coordinate Bike Week for the city of Boulder. So as an event planner, and it just you know one thing led to another, and here I am. But along the way, you know, I was a hotel maid. I shucked scallops for a season on Martha's Vineyard. You know, all these things I think prepare you for the wide ranging needs of being a transportation expert. Daryl. The one thing that I did do that wasn't a job was when I was a sophomore in high school, um, I led an effort to create uh, the city of Sunnyvale's first bike lanes. We had more parents attend the city council meeting than had ever been there before. Um, and I learned that you can actually do something as a punky sophomore in high school. And that kind of got me thinking about the ability to make a difference and moved on to registering voters and working in politics. And here I am now in philanthropy. And I would say I'm not an expert on transportation. I'm a transportation geek. But we have with us three experts on transportation. And we're going to use that as a way to closing. Out. That's, that's what we call a transition. We're going to transition <laughs> out of here. Um, if you like this broadcast, like it. Uh, and subscribe. Uh, we'll be back soon with more updates on what's going on. Um, we urge you to go to the mobility and access collaborative.org website to learn more about the mobility fund, which is supporting all the grassroots efforts to improve our federal transportation policy and grassroots efforts. Um, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.